right. All right. Time for episode five. Episode five. Can't believe we're already at episode five. Oh my it's, gosh. Time flies when you're having fun. That's right. Um, today's topic came up sort of organically this week as um, it was back to school week, which had me very busy. I'm sure it had you busy as yes. you've got multiple students in your household. I do. Student athletes at that. Yep. And uh, there was two nights this week where I came home completely exhausted, mm-hmm. but it was only like six o'clock. It was the, it was like the earliest nights I got home this week. It, it wasn't I was like for bed yet. I want to go to bed immediately. Right. It's a little too early for bed. So let's just plop down on my couch. Let's throw on a movie yes. that's going to help me relax. I know I'm going to enjoy it. Let's throw on one of my comfort movies. Yeah. And that led me to this idea of like, I just kind of want to talk about this idea of comfort, comfort movies. movies that you go back to. Great idea. So, uh, I look, one of the things I love about you, Andy, is I messaged you this idea, and I was like, just let me know if you hate any of these ideas, and you were like, love it, I'm in. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm the most joyful podcaster in the world, because I, when, I, you know, when we first started and I said this was a dream come true, I wasn't kidding. I don't, <laughs> I'm so happy. So whatever idea you come up with, I'm just, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. So, but this was a great idea, and I'm excited to find out what some of your comfort movies are. Um, as I was looking at my list and I was thinking about what my comfort movies selections would be, it occurred to me that um, at least what I imagine would be most people's idea of a comfort movie Mm -hmm. was not what I was going for. Okay. Now, I guess I'll kind of start by saying what my comfort movies are not. And I think uh, there's probably more than one way to look at this because... uh, I think of comfort movie as something that I watch on my own. Mm-hmm. There are certainly movies that are like movies that I watch with friends mm-hmm. that might be considered comfort movies. And that's where I usually go for comedies. Okay. When I'm on my yeah. own, my comfort movies usually aren't comedies. And sure. I think people might think that because comedies are usually more lighthearted, that that might be where you kind of throw yeah. it on for fun or comfort. Not where I go at all. That's fair. There's something about laughing with a group of your friends. As opposed to kind of the awkwardness of just laughing by yourself at something. I think that's probably, yeah, actually the best way to frame it. Yeah, is, yeah like when you're, yeah. when you're by yourself, you're laughing at you. Hey, that's, no, there's nobody yeah. here. <laughs> so, uh, so I didn't go with, with comedies. And, okay. and I was kind of dwindling down. And was, uh, I don't choose a lot of action. Uh, there's certainly action in some of the movies I'm picking, but they're not like, it's not die hard. Okay. That level of action. Okay. Uh, of course, I don't go war movies. Those aren't going to be comforting. <laughs> no, um, you're not going to throw on Saving Private Ryan. I don't go horror movies. Uh, what I found was I sort of dramas, but usually not like heavy dramas. Okay. And my brother once summed this up well for the two of us, um, kind of unintentionally. He was talking about what kind of shows or movies he likes, mm-hmm. and he said that his favorite genre is smartest guy in the room oh. genre. That's a and great like, genre. As I was looking through all my comfort movies, you it occurred that's to me. What yours were? I think that's what it is. I think what comforts me is smartest guy in the room, or most capable guy in the room, mm-hmm. or something on, along those lines. And actually, sometimes even that's a little. But something about the character is confident, mm-hmm. or you know, driven in a way that's. When it brings me comfort because I think when I'm stressed, when I got a lot going on, I want to watch somebody who's just in control. Someone's got everything under control. Exactly. That's really interesting. And that uh, mm-hmm. that brings me comfort. Okay, that's really interesting. So you don't want to watch a high stress. This character is going to have a bunch of ups and downs, and you like the the he's got everything under control. He's got everything figured out. I well, I don't mind if things are going wrong for the character as long as they. Again, are still. I mean, I, I guess as we get into this list, it'll probably be easier for me to explain it'll it'll how these apply. More. Okay, uh, because there are some examples I'll give where like the character's certainly not under control or okay. doesn't have circumstances under control, but they're right. Yeah, <laughs> even if they're yeah. if they don't. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you want to give any sort of preliminary thoughts on on your list before we start getting into specifics. <laughs> sure, um, my list is ridiculous <laughs> because what I found. Is, you sent me the text like you usually do and so of course I immediately started thinking what are my comfort movies so I'm kind of like you I was more able to rule out what are not my comfort movies and I'm thinking 
as far as like like what you're talking about, like I've had a long week and I just want to unwind. Of course, I don't want to put any. You know, that's not the time I want to tackle the Godfather. Let's, you know, as an example, right. I'm not looking for a three hour. Um, you know, I've got to follow these characters and this person is backstabbing this person and you know they're saying they're loyal to him but they're really not i don't want to do a lot of thinking which will become a very apparent when i start naming some of my movies and then i also just kind of found that um and i guess this is probably would be a common thing is my comfort movies are the movies i'm most familiar with which is i think similar to what you're saying whereas like you're talking about the character and the smartest guy in the room if i'm if i'm just looking to relax or unwind I just, it's not the time I want to try to dissect a movie or notice things I've never noticed before or pick up on character nuances. I really just want to go to something familiar that I can even drift in and out of a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm kind of unwinding or, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relax. I may check my phone a couple of times. So I just like having something on that I'm familiar with. And, and I'll, I'll add some more comments when I start giving some of my movies. All right. Well, I actually, I kind of did some of my movies as groupings, Mm -hmm. uh, and I figured I would just kind of choose one specific from those groupings um, in order to get into it. And so, you know, I didn't, I thought about kind of ranking some, and I was like, I'm not going to go with a ranking. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to kind of go with these sort of groupings. And the first grouping, uh, which should be fairly obvious if people have been listening at all to this, uh, is Aaron Sorkin movies. Sure. And it occurred to me, like, that's why I love Sorkin. Sorkin loves writing smartest guy in the room. He, he likes, yes. He doesn't write dumb characters in his mm-hmm. things, like, ever. He might write, like, clumsy. They might say the wrong thing, that sort of thing. But they're always kind of just sharp. Yeah. And um, so I've already talked about a couple of his movies. The one that I wanted to talk about for these purposes, because my love for it is probably exceeds um, how good it is or its reputation is Molly's Game. Oh, okay. Molly's Game was actually his directorial yes. debut. It stars Jessica Chastain, yep. uh, and it's based on a true story. Mm-hmm. You never, I never know how true the story is, and I never true really story. care. I, it's one of those ones I didn't even want to go find out how accurate no. it was because I don't care I don't either. about the real person. I care about the movie version, yep. which I really enjoy. But anyways, Molly is uh, an ex, uh, like Olympic-level snow skier yes. who gets injured and ends up uh, starting a new life in California and through circumstances where she's an assistant for this guy ends up running a poker game for him and then moves beyond from him and running these really high stakes poker games yep. and just the the trouble that ensues she ends up in a lawsuit because she has people in her poker game that are connected to the mob mm-hmm. unbeknownst to her according to the movie um, but anyways it's just again there's lots of conflict in there but mm-hmm. just the way they navigate it her intelligence through it and yeah. Uh, it just it's a comfort movie for me because uh, I just again enjoy seeing somebody be really excellent at what they're doing and she does she she runs a great poker game yeah. throughout the movie yeah. and she presents herself very confidently and even though things are crazy around her she's she's holding she's it together. in control yeah. yeah well and with Sorkin too you usually get at least one great speech mm-hmm. I love a good scene of someone just giving a confident speech. Like, I think of something like, uh, did Sorkin write The American President? He did. Okay. I think of, like, Michael Douglas there towards the end. He just gives this really great speech. And he's putting down his, uh, the person who's running against yeah. him. And Richard, that just gives Richard you Dreyfus. like that. Yeah, Richard Dreyfus. It just gives you like that. Yes. I love, yeah. I love a good conference. And he's not screaming and yelling. He's just speaking confidently. So I, I understand definitely what you're saying. Yeah, one of the the big moments of Molly's game is uh, her lawyer is played by Idris Elba, mm-hmm. and he's asking why she won't make this deal with the government because it will essentially it will wreck her name mm-hmm. uh, to say that she didn't have the integrity to do whatever it was that she has to kind of confess to. And he asks, "Why do you care so much?" She says, "Because my name is my name, and it's a reference to the Crucible, yeah. which he had her read or reference to reading." And I love that one because Crucible is one of the few books I remember reading in high school. There you go. I was like, hey, not only do I love this movie, I get that reference. I know what he's talking <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's, but that whole, uh, you know, just a whole genre of Sorkin okay. that I go to. His shows, uh, his movies are all comfort movies. So, of course, Molly's Game is the one I talked about, but. Uh, you can pick any of them. And actually, now that I, now that I say this, I have two Sorkin movies on my list, and but throwing the other ones in, Steve Jobs, Social Network, of course, mm-hmm. Few Good Men, yeah. uh, just all of them, 
kind of have the same vibe, and that's why I just wanted to throw mm-hmm. out one. Excellent. I, I I wouldn't have guessed that was going to be. I should. I figured you'd bring up Sorkin, but I was interested in brought Molly's game. Yeah. Well, I that's I wanted to pick one that I knew people wouldn't think is mm-hmm. the typical like yeah Sorkin hit. Yeah. So do you want me to give one of mine? Absolutely. <laughs> so very, no, not similar at all. So I feel like I have to justify my answer because it's ridiculous. Rocky Four. You know what? <laughs> I if I had to gam if I was a gambling man and I could bet on movies yeah. that would come up, I was gonna bet Rocky Four for you. And you know yes. what? I don't think you should justify it. I don't think you should you should explain I should be it. Proud. I think that Rocky Four is like Christmas morning it's incredible. in front of a fireplace wrapped in a blanket with hot cocoa opening presents. It That's is. what Rocky Four is. Thank you so much. This is why we're a podcast team. Yeah. So this is the this is such an interesting question you proposed about comfort movies because I did find that my favorite movies, you know, I've said this on this mm-hmm. pod before, my favorite movie of all time is Jaws. So I'm always happy to turn that on. But if I do turn it on, I want to watch the whole thing, even though I've seen it 10,000 times because I'm just watching it and admiring it and not really looking for things I've never seen before, but just, just admiring the craft of that movie. So I'm, I don't think of that as relaxing. I think of it as an enjoyable experience, but I'm I'm so invested into the movie. To me, like I said at the top, the, uh, uh, a comfort movie to me is just I just like having this movie on. And, and you know, Rocky Four is if, if I drift off for a couple of minutes, I'm not going to be lost. It's not a complex plot, Jeremy. It's <laughs> it's a it's a really simple movie to follow. It's so enjoyable. It's so ridiculous. It's at this yeah. point it has become an unintentional comedy, mm-hmm. and I just love having it on, except for when spoiler alert when Apollo dies. That makes yeah. me sad. But it's there's thirty eight different ridiculous things that happen in that movie, and I just watch it. And if I am having a long day or it's been a bad week or something, the absurdity of that movie can take my mind off. You know, if even just for a moment. So I just love having Rocky Four in my life. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes the simplicity of here's the good guy, here's the bad guy, yes, and the the good setup of David versus Goliath, it's, and it's, and just everything. It's just pointing to that. It is. It doesn't need any extra fat. In fact, oh my gosh, it's not a very long movie. It's like fifty percent montages. I, I, literally, it's like thirty percent montage. I looked this up once before. I don't remember the exact number. It's a ridiculously high number. It's barely a movie. Yeah, it barely qualifies as a movie. And one of the montages is like just a bunch of flashbacks from the previous, previous movies. Rocky movies. Yeah. It's ridiculous. There's a robot. They buy Polly a robot. It's probably the worst thirty second scene in movie history. It's the most eighties scene in movie history. <laughs> Somehow I always forget about the robot. It, you might your brain might be in self defense mode and trying to block that out. So it is funny. Maybe it's a lot about you and I that you chose a. A smart, well-written, esteemed writer, director Aaron Sorkin movie, and I chose Rocky IV. But you know, it, and like you said, it's the it's the good guy versus bad guy, and it's David versus Goliath. But then you just throw in the excess and the ridiculousness of the '80s on top of that, and you got Rocky IV. So you put that on, and I am I am comforted. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> No, I'm I'm so glad. And actually, like I even thought about Rocky IV, and it yeah, I I didn't include it, and I thought I bet Andy will bring it up, and I'll get to talk about it anyway. Yeah. So yeah, just any any reason to talk about Rocky IV is yeah, is, makes me happy. Um, my next category is um, crime movies, mm-hmm. and usually when I say crime movies, uh, usually like bank robber movies. Yeah, because it's usually like not like a murder spree like seven like that's not gonna comfort me no uh i hope that doesn't bring anybody comfort. but a good heist movie which usually is more about sort of the human conflict Mm -hmm. uh and so the one i go to for this is inside man oh yeah michael man spike lee directed oh is it spike lee michael man was originally attached i think okay spike lee did it okay it's one of the few movies that i can think of that spike lee directed that he didn't write and i actually i don't know i don't not that i dislike spike lee written movies yeah i kind of like uh, you know, we talked about sometimes uh, when somebody has too much control over their films, yeah. like some of their their negative impulses can impact mm-hmm. it. And I felt like this was Spike Lee came in. It's somebody else's script, so he just goes, "I'm just going to direct the heck out of this yeah. thing. I'm not focused on the story. I'm not like 
you know, so invested in these characters that have to do it anyways. No, uh, I Inside like Man, nerdy rants. Denz, Denzel, Denzel Washington is Jody the... Jodie Foster. Jodie Foster. Clive Owen is the yeah. bank robber, and it's... It's classic, like, smartest man in the room, because Clive yeah. Owen plays this bank robber who's planned everything to perfection. Yes. He says it in this beginning, straight-to-camera monologue. Yes. Denzel Washington, though, is a very intelligent uh, detective trying to yeah. be the negotiator at this heist. There ends up being more going on than they think, yes. but it's just another one uh, that's a really great smartest man in the room mm-hmm. uh, movie, and, and I love a, a good heist movie anyways. Yes. Yeah. The Insider is what I was thinking. The about. Insider is a Michael, Michael Mann movie. Yes. I was, yeah. Um, which is also a good movie, but it's a good but, movie, yeah. But yeah, Inside Inside Man is is uh, mm-hmm. the the crime movie that I would, oh, I would nice. select, and I would also throw movies I've talked about before, like Hell or High Water, which yeah. is about you know simpler yes. bank robberies, and and there's other examples, but mm-hmm. that's yeah. a really Inside Man is a really good movie. Yeah, yeah. It has a sequel, which I've never seen. It does? Uh, oh, I didn't even know that. I, yeah. Um, and then it, I don't know if there, there's a show that has the same name that I don't know if it's based on the same concept or if it just has the same name yeah. uh, that I also have never seen because that's okay. I'm like, don't, I don't need to, I didn't need any more to this. No, but, definitely not. Yeah. All right. You got another one? A crime movie? Or just any. I'll, I'll stick yeah, with yeah, your okay, themes. Okay. Uh, a crime movie I like to revisit a lot. And this, this whole podcast is just going to make me sound so weird. Heat. That's, no, that's a great movie. It's a, I, it is, no, it's a great movie, yeah. but it, it's funny, I guess, when you think of it as like a comfort movie. Yeah. Because it's bad people doing bad things. But I love the idea. I remember reading once where Michael Mann said he looked as Heat as like a, a almost as much a movie, movie about the city. Mm-hmm. It's like this big city movie. And mm-hmm. there's, you know, these just these characters inhabiting this city. And I just thought that was a cool way to look at it. So I just like the idea of this big, big city, crime, cops, all that kind of stuff. I just always liked, and it's a, it's a long movie. I think it's a three-hour movie. Back in my day, it was a two, two cassette VHS. The first time I ever saw it, I rented it, and it was two cassettes. Yeah. Um, but I just like being. I like. I like when I get to just go into a world. And Michael Mann's really good at that. He just puts you in a world, and it's a different world, and um, there's. Of course, a lot of action, but I also love the the little moments. It was famous for having the De Niro Pacino like one on one. So that's a movie. It's on Netflix right now. And sometimes, if I'm, you know, just want to sit for a little bit, or if I'm kind of doing stuff but moving around the house, I just like it. I like having that on, and I'll stop, you know, for five or ten minutes at a time and watch it. Yeah, I think uh, it definitely has the elements of Smartest Man in the Room. Oh yeah, great, great detective Al Pacino, great. Yep. Robber and De Niro, De Niro and they're yep. both like kind of the top of their field mm-hmm. it's also got the element of like they both have their crews you get to spend time with yes, that. and like you enjoy being with both groups of people yeah. and it kind of shows you like there's a lot of similarities between these two they're just on different sides of the law yeah. this, this group and this team they're mm-hmm. all close and connected but they're just trying to steal things this team's all close and connected yeah. and they're just trying to stop these guys yeah. and uh and yeah, it, you kind of just enjoy bouncing back and forth between those two worlds, like you said. Definitely. And I love a movie. Um, I can I can really um, just sit back and enjoy a movie with a loaded cast, mm-hmm. which Heat has. Like all throughout the movie, you're just seeing people like I know who that is. I know yep. like, Val Kilmer's in it. Guy Val Kilmer, yeah. Tom Sizemore is in it. Um, Ashley Judd's in it. Yeah. Natalie Portman's in it. She's just a kid. It, there's a lot more. In Hank Azaria's in it. There's yeah. just a lot of people in that movie. So that's a, that's definitely one for me. Yeah, really good one. Um, all right, my next category okay. again, just gonna gonna choose one um, is sports movies. Mm-hmm. Now, again, not usually as much sports comedy, so not Happy Gilmore, even though I love Happy Gilmore. Mm-hmm. Not usually overly dramatic sports movies. Yeah. Um, so like I I love the movie. Um, Friday Night Lights, mm-hmm. but that's not quite what I'm going to because it's a little like heavy. Like yeah, it really lays a, on, little lady, little, yeah. lays on the drama. Uh, and so uh, the one that I wrote down is Miracle, which is oh, Kurt Russell, uh, actually my favorite sports movie of all yeah. time. And it's you know based on a true story again. Mm-hmm. The 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team beating the Soviet Union team, which was like the 
Goliath of its time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if it's not quite the smartest person in the room, it's the uh, maybe most capable person in the room because it's the story of this coach who drives his team and knows exactly yeah. what to do in yep. order to build a team and prepare them to beat this yeah. this juggernaut. And it's, it's almost like the... Um, <laughs> little more serious version of Rocky IV and that it's very clear like yeah. they, they do a good job actually a miracle of making it clear that the Soviets weren't evil people they were right. just this very great hockey team they were trying mm -hmm. to beat uh, but it's a clear like you're rooting for the USA team oh, definitely. you wanted to beat the Soviets you're watching them build up to this task mm -hmm. and then you get to watch them complete the task and uh, really good hockey scenes in that movie too the hockey is done really well incredible i always say that uh hockey is probably the most cinematic of all the sports oh, yeah. like it just point. makes the best and it's probably in part because i don't really know hockey i don't ever watch real hockey so, so you maybe, can't really critique it right maybe it's like i'm very critical of basketball movies and like oh, you know that, basketball that guy clearly can't shoot and they're trying to make him look like he can shoot and yeah. that sort of thing in hockey like i i couldn't tell you that i could tell you otherwise but i also know that for the most part they cast actual hockey players to play the mm -hmm. parts uh and then had them act there was a couple guys who had a little acting experience mm -hmm. but uh and you can kind of see that on the in the product is it the guys look great on, yeah. the, on the hockey rink. Well, and Kurt Russell, I think, just qualifies as like, I just like watching this guy in movies. I do too. It was also just a great performance from him. I He's remember really seeing great behind the, the scenes thing, and, and he said when he first got the part, he talked talking to the uh, director, Gavin O'Connor, mm -hmm. said, uh, I can do this two ways. I can play a coach who happens to be named Herb Brooks, or I can play Herb Brooks. Mm -hmm. And Gavin O'Connor says, I want you to play Herb Brooks. And so he did. He like, oh, nice. you know, I, again, I don't know a lot about Herb Brooks, but I can tell Kurt Russell took on a whole like different yeah. sort of uh, persona. persona. A guy yeah. from, he, Herb Brooks coached at uh, Minnesota, I think, and he kind of had this like, yeah, you know, how you doing there, you know, like mm -hmm. affectation, the way yeah. he talked and like different demeanor. And I was like, okay, he, he became kind of a different person yeah. than the Kurt Russell I generally know or think of. Yeah. thought that was a great performance by him that I wish would have gotten more uh, recognition. recognition. He's excellent. Kurt Russell would probably be an interesting conversation of like, I, I'm, I doubt he's ever been bad in a movie. Right. Even if I didn't love the movie, he, he is so solid yeah. and so dependable. Yeah. Uh, Bill Simmons does a, a thing sometimes. Um uh, Underrated, overrated, or properly probably rated, rated. and he'd be, it, Kurt Russell would be an interesting one because I would say he's probably underrated, but also he's had a long career. And he, he started as a, a kid and like things. Disney stuff. So you know, it's probably hard to say if he's underrated, overrated, or properly rated because you pull a hundred people and they probably have different mm -hmm. <laughs> opinions of Kurt Russell. A lot of people probably younger people probably don't know who he is. Probably not. Which is why I would say underrated. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of older people would be like. Kurt Russell's fantastic. He's, oh, my dad you know, loves Kurt Russell. Big Trouble in Little China. or He'll always you know, go to that one. Overboard. Uh, overboard. Stuff like uh, that. Yeah. Um, fun fact about Kurt Russell. We're just really on a tangent now. It's but, okay. Uh, the movie Bull Durham. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned this on Bill Simmons' podcast. He had Kurt Russell on there. Yeah. And Kurt Russell originally helped kind of draft up the story for that movie because Kurt Russell had played a little like minor league baseball. Yeah. And... A lot of the stories and stuff were things he had experienced, and he mm -hmm. was going to be in the movie. And then, because of conflicts, he didn't actually end up in the movie. Uh, but I just always thought that was fascinating that That's cool. Kurt Russell was like yeah. someone who helped shape this other famous yeah, sports really cool. movie. It's really funny, you know. You and I have talked before. I love that Bill Simmons. One of his podcasts is the Rewatchables, which is definitely my favorite podcast, other than our own, of course. Right. And I just listened to Miracle this week. Oh wow! I, I just sometimes just go back and just find old ones to listen to, and I just listened to Miracle. And Bill Simmons also tells this funny story about having Kurt Russell on his podcast, where he was saying like a lot of times when he interview interviews actors celebrities they show up and they've got like their pr team with them and they've got security and he's like kurt russell just rolled up by himself leather jacket cigarette in hand and was just like all right let's talk <laughs> he's just like so laid back yeah just yeah. like the coolest guy coolest guy yeah. yep i love it okay sports movie rocky three <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> no, uh, I, I apologize for Rocky Four. I won't apologize again. <laughs> Rocky Three, man. Like, yeah. give me. So, like, Rocky. This is funny. Rocky One is a, a real movie, right? I mean, Rocky One won. Rocky One won Best Picture at the Oscars in right. nineteen. It literally won Best Picture and Best Director. It's a movie. Mm -hmm. You know, Rocky Two. 
still a movie, pretty much. You know, it's yeah. a little more um, not action, but not quite maybe as prestige as Rocky One, right. but it's still. And Rocky Three, it was like Stallone just was like, you know what? People they want to see me train. Yeah. They want they want to see me and Apollo together, and they just want boxing. Well, they they finally kind of went away from Rocky's. There's something mentally wrong with Rocky. Mm-hmm. Like one and two, two has some like painful to watch scenes. Like him trying to record commercials, he can't and he's read. just like he's literally yeah, illiterate. He, yeah, and you're just like, I get what they're doing. They're trying to show you this like real character with these big flaws. And yeah. by Rocky three, they're like, you know what's kind of a bummer. Is that Rocky's an idiot? Yeah. Now <laughs> let's let's lean away from that and yeah. lean into Rocky's uh, just a, the positive qualities. That's hard working, hard oh training, hard hitting, yeah. great guy, and, and ju- that's it. Yeah. And just like Rocky Four, Rocky Three is almost become an unintentional comedy. So I would highly recommend if you want some amusement, go fire up Rocky Three. And after again, spoiler alerts, but after Mick the trainer passes away, right. <laughs> Rocky um, speaks at Mick's funeral, and he's trying to speak. Mick is Jewish. Rocky's trying to say some Jewish phrases, and you can literally, you cannot. Stallone is mumbling to the point where you cannot. It, it's just, I, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining. It. It's ridiculous. I also want to add, Stallone wrote and directed Rocky two, II, three, and four. And I think I think that's why they're comfort movies to me too, because you just think like, man, Stallone was just so into himself, which is just hilarious to me. You know, it's like he decided to Rocky Four. You know what? Rocky is just gonna unite the world, you know, and the Russians are gonna start shit. Like, I guess it's almost like his ego was probably out of control, and there was just he was. Powerful enough, and right. he was a big enough deal in the '80s where there was really no one that could be like, "Hey, hey, Stallone, yeah. maybe just just tone this down a little bit." And there was no one to do that, so it's just Stallone running wild and doing these really ridiculous, entertaining movies. So I'm gonna go with those every time. Yeah, and I think uh, Mr. T is fantastic. That He's movie, great. It's, it's so funny to see because, like, you say Mr. T, and people kind of laugh, like, "Oh yeah, it's Mr. T." No. He's he so was, good. He was amazing as Clubber Lang. Like, he was he's amazing. Menacing yes. and like he looks the huge. part. He's, yeah. When when he hits you, you really buy like, yeah, I'm sure that would knock somebody. Yeah. Out. Like I, you get why Rocky was afraid to fight this guy. Definitely. Like, he seems scary. <laughs> and also, like I said too, just there's a scene where Rocky and Apollo are running on the beach together. There's just a lot of close ups of like their sweaty legs, and then they run into the ocean together and just embrace. And it's so. <laughs> Absurd. Yeah. I, it just brings a smile to my face every time. I uh, <laughs> that reminds me. A couple months ago, you posted a picture of Ryan and Mitt, but it was Riggs yes. and Murtaugh from <laughs> Lethal Weapon. And I, I started to go and comment uh, and put a picture of that Apollo and Rocky. Say, yeah. I like this one of yeah. of Ryan and Mitt. Yeah, uh, but just get around to it. Just so much joy is brought from those, and it's like it's not quite as ridiculous as Rocky Four. It's not. There's not near as many montages and stuff, but it's just, you know, something great to have on and just makes me happy, makes me smile, makes me laugh even when it's not supposed to. But I don't want to sound like I'm just saying those are terrible movies. Stallone, you know, Mr. T is good. Stallone did write good villains. It it does get you excited to watch Rocky Train. You know, they're, they're good movies. I'm yeah, not trying to they're, say they're not. They're just ridiculous. There's a weird sort of um, actual truth and uh, insight into the way that sports psychology works in that yeah. movie. In that, like, Rocky reaches the top yeah. and he loses his edge. Yeah. He just, and the guy who's actually hungry comes up. And, like, so the eye of the tiger thing, like, that's such a great line. Yeah. It's so true. And, like, sports people have been, like, pointing that Mm-hmm. For years, being yeah. like the example of you lose your edge when you get to the top, and yeah. so like so that actually like that's what we're talking about. In all the cheesiness, there's like actually that's, a brilliant yeah. character arc. There, there. there really is, and I think it's just the, the combination of the two things: so cheesy, so ridiculous. But because I don't want to sound like I'm being negative towards Stallone or the Rocky movies, which I love dearly, Stallone just had this. He he was smart. I think he is a smart writer. And I think he, I, th- I honestly, I would, I've said this before, 
Say what you will about Stallone or Rocky movies, but Stallone, you know, Rocky is a Stallone invention. Mm-hmm. It, it came from him. I mean, he created one of, I would say, top five most well-known, famous movie characters ever in history. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's easy to poke fun at Stallone and his acting sometimes and his choices and the excess and the and the cheesiness, but he was a really smart guy and made a yeah. character who... I don't, I've never met anybody that's like, who's Rocky? I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. So, Rocky 3 and 4 are just the best examples of combining the cheesiness with the awesomeness. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, so, I'm going to throw some, some ones that don't really fall neatly into my sure. three main categories there okay. of... of um, what did I have? Sorkin, sports, and crime. Crime. Uh, but one of my ones is the movie Chef. Oh yeah, which John Favreau, Favreau and... which still kind of goes along with the um, smartest guy, the robot, yeah. or best, most capable guy, yeah. really capable chef, doing what he loves. Yeah. Uh, kind of a family movie, but I would maybe put this under a subcategory of. Um, people kind of hanging with their crew mm-hmm. because oh, that's what a good really one. where chef really shines is when they're on the road trip and it's yes. John Favreau, John Leguizamo yes. and the kid who plays his son mm-hmm. and the three of them are together yeah. doing this just stuff doing their thing. and you're just like, I just want to be with that group. Yes. I just want to hang with that crew. Mm-hmm. I want to be part of the team. I want to be the fourth member yeah. working the food truck, yeah. which I would never think I would want to do. But they the make it look so appealing. Yeah. They make it look so much fun. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, you know, so it's it's kind of a comedy. I don't know what you would categorize that movie as. Yeah, it's a comedy, but something complete, not a Adam Sandler comedy. Right. I mean, it's so different than that. Yeah. So it's just it's just a fun hang. That's, that's a great choice. Yeah. That uh, that's a, just an interesting movie too, because Favreau, you know, he had made it big with Iron Man and stuff in the MCU, mm-hmm. and then he purposely made that choice to just make a small, right, low budget movie. And. <laughs> goes right along with the Rocky theme where you, I'm sure you've heard it said that a lot of the Rocky mo- movies mirror Stallone where he was in his career. In real life, yeah. Chef did the same thing. Um, although in, in the Chef movie, he plays a chef who's at this uh, restaurant that's whatever. What's the stars? How many stars restaurants get? It's yeah. a top of the line restaurant. Mm-hmm. And he gets fired. So he goes to this food truck, which is a small project. Mm-hmm. He didn't get fired from the MCU or anything, but he went from this big established yeah. thing and said, I want to go to do my version of a small, small. thing. And he even chef, grabbed some of the and, MCU people and, to yes, be in the grabbed, movie. Yes, brought in some people along for the ride, yeah. did a great thing, everybody loved it and celebrated yeah, I think it. It was almost a, made them, people love them again. Yeah, yeah. That's a great choice. That's a great, uh, just a great movie for this topic. Yeah. Also, one of those movies that uh, makes food look really good. Oh, I mean, most movies do, but like that's one that you really watch does. and you go, I need to eat some food. And then you go look in your pantry and you're like, Nothing I eat's gonna look like look like the that. Food that and I'm I pretty have. sure I think I'm right about this. That's one of those movies where I think those guys really did learn yeah. how to. Oh yeah, he trained. Yeah, he trained, and like they, when he's chopping stuff, I mean that's really him doing it. And yeah, 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 for sure. That's a great choice. Uh, you want me to kind of try and name one that doesn't really? Sure. So uh, going off your Favreau thing, and this is more. I think a lot of times your comfort movies are kind of movies that you grew up on or that mm-hmm. you watched at a pivotal point. So for me, like a, a big Favreau thing would be Swingers, mm-hmm. which is just a guys hanging out movie. Yeah. And it's hard. I always I always tell my kids when I'm trying to educate them about movies, you almost have to understand. Not just the movie, but the narrative that was going on around the time the movie came out. And with Swingers, there are just... I, I'm sure there, there were, and I just don't know them. But that really seemed like an innovative original... Like, this is just a movie about guys hanging out? And they were, you know, kind trying, of... Trying to be cool. Trying to be cool, but they were kind of losers. But... Um, and it's just them and kind of their escapades, and it's it, it's got a lot. It, it was kind of riding the Tarantino wave of the '90s, where you've got like the snappy dialogue, and there's even like a com- direct like Reservoir Dogs um, oh, homage yeah. with them right. walking and stuff. So that I think that would kind of fall under what you're saying too. Like just a it's it's a very small, I mean micro budget movie, and it's just dudes hanging out, which is. Something that's, you know, comforting to go to. 
Yeah, it's the movie that launched Vince Vaughn. Vince Vaughn. And he's mm-hmm. very Vince Vaughn in the movie. He like, Vince Vaughn. Very, he's great in the movie. Yeah, he's fantastic. And actually, uh, I believe I read that uh, Spielberg saw it and loved Vince I've Vaughn so that. much that he cast him in the cast Jurassic him in, in Park the sequel. World. Yeah. 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 Uh, and it's always fun, too. You go back and watch a movie like that, they're so young. I think oh, it's yeah. 90, 95 or 96. I mean, Vince Vaughn is so young. Favreau is so young. Yeah. And it was just, it was cool at the time. I was 15, 16 when it came out. Like I said, to just watch guys that was like, oh, these guys are kind of like me. They're not really that cool, but, yeah. you know. But it's like they, they're cool enough in their own minds, in their own group, yeah. that it makes it like, even if they're not cool, mm-hmm. you're like, you're you know, they, they say silly things like, you're so money. Yeah. And, but they just say it with such conviction. You're and so like, money that you don't even know how yeah. money you are. You start saying it with your friends. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, we, just, we completely boosted phrases from that movie. Yeah. And like Chef, it's one of those movies like they're in diners and you go, oh, that looks that food looks really good. We should go to a diner. So that was, it was it's a cool one. It's not one I go back to a lot. But if I do catch it or sometimes, you know, if it's on streaming or whatever it's like yeah i like i just like being with these guys yeah uh it was all, it's also um one of the first movies i saw that um uh, was kind of behind the industry too because mm-hmm. the characters in it are like wannabe actors yes. and that sort of thing and there's a lot of like little great insights yeah. Yeah. uh into it you know and just the struggle of trying to be out there and Ron Livingston's character was Ron like, like yeah. where he came from. He was play, doing like stage plays like yeah. Hamlet. And now he's trying to get the role of like Goofy at yeah. like a theme park yeah. or something. They, they, it's like one of those fun movies where they're not afraid to basically just make fun of themselves, you know, within yeah. the movie and stuff. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so another one that I have on my list that didn't really fall into any of my other categories, but certainly falls into smartest guy in the room category is Goodwill Hunting. Oh, the epitome yeah. of smartest guy in the room. Literally, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. this guy who's just a off the charts genius, mm-hmm. but very broken and troubled. Yes, um, which is where you know, like, I was kind of talking about, it doesn't always have to be that the guy's like always in control or mm-hmm. anything. Like the Goodwill Hunting is a movie about a guy whose life's kind of out of control, yeah. even though he's got this amazing gift mm-hmm. and unreal Robin Williams performance. Unbelievable, uh, and I. I with all yeah. due respect, I'm not. He's not. The, he's not real high up on my list of favorite actors. I thought he just made some weird choices, and sometimes he was just too, just too much for me. Yeah. He is so good in that movie. He is unbelievable. He is, and um, it's a it's another great like just hang out with. The crew movie oh too, gosh. like him and it, Ben Affleck and Casey Affleck and yeah, I don't know uh, Cole Hauser. Cole Hauser. Cole Hauser. Yeah. Like, and yeah, I was looking. At, I looked at a picture of them today, and I was like, "What a what a loaded group." Those were all four unknowns when the movie came out, and now you've got uh, Damon, who's one of the biggest movie stars in the world. Yeah, Affleck, who's this big movie star slash director. director. He's directed some really good movie. movies. Casey Affleck, who's won an Oscar, won an Oscar. for acting, yeah. and then Cole Hauser, who. Uh, not as big as those other guys, but has become huge as Rip in the Yellowstone, Yellowstone. show, and mm-hmm. is pretty much everybody's favorite Yellowstone character. Yeah. Well, that's what I went. You know, going back to what I was saying with Swingers, like sometimes you have to understand what all was going on around the movie, and in just one movie, all of a sudden Damon and Affleck are they went from nobodies to like two of the most well known biggest star. That was a big narrative going on around that movie. Like these guys wrote this movie, they're star in this movie. And they're both awesome in this movie. Now they are in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And I still, um, I'm an Affleck guy. I like Affleck. I do too. I think he's, I think he's gotten I, a bad I think that he's had a lot of misses, but. He has. And for some reason, he's just always, they, people just love to dump on Affleck yeah. for some reason. I, I think, think he's good. I think one of the things that disappoints me a little as an Affleck fan is he's so good at the character he plays in Good Will Hunting, the really charismatic big talker, kind of like a Vince Vaughn. Like, yeah, if you were recasting Vince. swingers at that time, but you would have done Affleck would have been perfect. Mm-hmm. And I think Affleck was trying so hard to be taken serious for a while that he mm-hmm. kind of got away from, like, I'm going to stop playing that. And he didn't play to his best strength, which was being a big personality. Yeah. And yeah. I liked, I love to see Affleck play oh, a like, big personality. I, too. I like Affleck a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 
That was a cool. I saw Good Will Hunting, and I was just telling you the other day. In like a small amount of time in 1997, like I want to say like two month period, I saw Boogie Nights, Titanic, Jackie Brown, and Good Will Hunting in the theater. Just wanted to work that in somewhere to yeah. brag about that incredible run I got to see in '97. Yeah. All right, you got another one. Oh yeah, I've got one, and I I say this proudly: Clueless. Okay. I love that movie. It is a movie about mostly about it's te- it's a teenage movie. It's very very '90s. It was Alicia Silverstone's huge breakout. Paul Rudd, one of his very first movies. Yep. That is such a fun movie. And talk about a movie where you just like, I just like spending time with these characters. They're funny. They're smartly written. Mm -hmm. It's a well-acted movie. Like, it's a great movie. That's definitely one of my comfort movies. That's a, it's one of those ones that, uh, you know, and I would put, put it right there hand in hand with Mean Girls. Like, Mm -hmm. the way it may be marketed or what you think it's going to be. You feel surprised when you find out, like, this movie's kind of for me, too. Yeah. Like, even though yeah. it looks like a teenage girl's movie from yes. the outside. But you're it's right. Not. It's very smartly written. It is. So that it's more accessible than it, it, just you would initially think. And it, it's a funny movie, but it's not funny because of, like, gross-out humor or, like, the Sandler, Adam Sandler kind of humor. It's so different than that. It's, it's, it's like, almost... Um, like observational humor or something, you know, and it's just Paul Rudd is so funny. Like he's just Paul Rudd, basically. He's just playing Paul Rudd. He's hey, hilarious. Looks exactly the same then as he does. He now. hasn't aged. <laughs> and one of the smartest things, and I think one of the reasons I love Clueless is because the dad character, Alicia Silverstone's dad in that movie, so many times in those movies, the parents or the, especially the dad are just written as the most clueless just stupid buffoons who have no idea. He's a good dad in that movie. He cares about his kid. There's no um, like unnecessary, they don't have this big falling out. or They just don't do a lot of the things that you see in, in movies like that where the parents are like the bad guy, basically. Right. He's a, he's a really well-written character. He's funny in the movie. Yeah. He just has some hilarious lines. Yeah, the actor's name is Dan, Dan Hedaya. Hedaya, or Hedaya, Hedaya, or Hedaya. Yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, he's one of those kind of a that guy. But he's really been in so likeable. many movies. Yeah. yeah, and he's just great. And yeah. that's I, I sing the praises of Clueless any chance I get. Sometimes I get made fun of for it, but I don't care. I stand <laughs> I, by it. It's a good movie. It's fun to be in that world. You're right. Like it's it's a movie I probably would have never thought of, but I can admit, like it's one of those movies that. In the olden days of surfing television stations, mm-hmm. if you come across it, you might stop on it for a couple minutes, and be like, "Oh, this is a funny scene." And before yeah. you know it, you've watched. Actually, no, you've the watched movie. the whole movie. Yeah. yeah, so that's a good choice. Yeah. All right. Just out of curiosity, how many more movies do you have to talk about? Because I just want to know how many I should, how select I should be. I can be at my last one. I can be at a couple more. I can, I can, as Captain America would say, I could do this all day long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one that. Uh, definitely falls into probably a, what people think of as a comfort movie and it's two that go together it's Days and Confused and Everybody Wants Some yeah. like Richard Linklater's yeah. two kind of decade movies yep. um, just hang out with a and big it, group it is of literally people. that uh, Days and Confused is all takes place in one, one day, day you know. end of school um, and it's all just sort of cruising around town trying to find the place to party trying to find the people yeah. you're going to party with Everybody Wants Some is set in college it's the beginning of the college year mm-hmm. these this baseball house or two baseball yeah. houses and guys hanging out and it is just like a lot of ridiculousness a little bit of hijinks and yep. but overall you're watching going like weirdly like i recognize people in this movie i went to college with people who were just oh, like this sure. in the movie like and it it just it feels so real even though it's definitely hyped up a little bit for oh, sure. cinematic value well, sure but it also yeah it just yeah. It, it just captures something like that's very fun just to yeah. hang out I, I love movies like that where the, the director, writer, did he write and direct those? Yes. Yeah. Where he just knows how to write and make characters who, like you said, maybe are a little exaggerated, but they do feel like real people, people that you knew or that you know or that you've heard about. And you just get to, you, you kind of just get planted in this world and you just watch the different dynamics between people. And that's always fun to me too. Yeah. And 
Uh, of course, Days and Confused launched Matthew McConaughey, yeah. such an iconic character. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think we will look back at Everybody Wants Some and say Glenn Powell launched in that movie. Yeah. He was becoming and now he more took of off because of Top Gun. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. Great soundtrack. Yeah. For Days and Confused. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just, those are just fun hangout yeah. movies and mm-hmm. probably go a little bit against my like smartest guy in the room <laughs> theory for sure because yeah. uh, what he does always have is his central character is always kind of surprisingly smart in yeah. those movies uh, and Dazed and Confused it's the is it Jason I think it's Jason London or Jeremy London it's one of the London guys yeah. one of the yeah. London boys who uh, plays the quarterback but he's also like friends with everybody because he's the quarterback, so he's friends with all the jocks, but he's actually kind of smart, so he's yeah. friends with the nerds, yes. and he's the, sort of the connective tissue of the mm-hmm. movie. And of course, everybody wants to think they're mo- most like that guy. Of course. <laughs> and then in, uh, everybody wants some, the main character is this freshman that comes in who's a baseball player, who's also, again, surprisingly smart, mm-hmm. and so you kind of get his perspective where the side characters are all sort of the knuckleheads and the mm-hmm. idiots, but at least the main guy is sort of smart, Yeah. Uh, so you can follow him. Yeah, two really good movies. Probably two movies that I should go back and revisit. Because I, yeah. I mean, to be honest, neither one of those are movies that I've gotten a lot of repeated viewings with. Not because I don't like them; right. just hasn't, for whatever reason, hasn't happened. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one that I think might win the award for most random movie. Oh, okay, wait. Clue. C- love Clue. Clue is so good. I love having that movie on and just. So, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Clue is literally based off of the board game Clue. Mm-hmm. And it is a absolute amazing performance from Tim Curry. Yes, it is. He carries that movie. Everybody's great in it. Everybody's funny. I don't even know how you would explain that movie to somebody. Because it's kind of a comedy. It's a murder mystery. Yeah. It's. I think the way you would have to explain it now is you would say it's like Knives Out or Glass Onion, twenty yes, years or thirty that, years beforehand. Oh, I can't believe I didn't think of that. That's a great way to put it. it I, so I've watched Clue my whole life since I was a little kid. I think when I was a little kid, because I like scary movies and it's not scary, but I thought it was so cool. Like put people in a in a huge mansion in a thunderstorm in the middle of the night, and then just a bunch of hijinks happen. Yeah. To me, that's just a fun premise for a movie. And then you just populate it with these really weird characters. And it, it's a really strange movie, but I mean that in the best way possible. Absolutely. It's uh, one of the earliest examples of a movie being really non-traditional in its ending that I can remember. Oh, my God. Like, multiple different endings. like Literally. Or this way. Or yeah. it's this. So when it came out in the theater... There's three different endings to the movie. Mm. And I, of course, I didn't see it. It was like 85, I think. Um, you would just go to the theater and they would just randomly show one of ending A, ending B, or ending C. That is wild. It's wild. That. And then on the, on the DVD, VHS, when it's on streaming, it just has them all. And if you watch it, the, you know, because the last like 20 minutes of the movie is just this amazing, like, Tim Curry just goes through the mansion and reenacts the whole night and he tells them what happened. He is so good in that. But if you actually pick apart the movie, none of them make sense. You know, they're like, well, when we were all in this room, Miss Scarlet snuck out and killed... But then when you watch the movie, Miss Scarlet is definitely in the room. Like, it makes no sense at all. But I've always loved just being in that mansion with those characters. And like I said, it's such a strange, hard-to-explain movie. Yeah. Yeah. But it's fun. I don't know anybody it's, who's ever said a bad word about it. It's probably one of those ones that's just not enough people have seen it. Not enough people have seen it. It bombed when it came out. Yeah. I think it kind of had a life on yeah. you know, maybe HBO and VHS and stuff. I love that movie. I do think it, it's gotten more respect now. And actually, I've heard, heard a lot of people when like, Knives Out came out who started saying, like, clue. Yeah, like, if you enjoyed this, there's this old movie a lot of people missed. Oh you should gosh. go back and it's check incredible. out. It's incredible. That and really I, good. at one point they were talking about doing a remake with Ryan Reynolds, and I really hope mm-hmm. that doesn't happen. I like Ryan Reynolds, but yeah, but leave that alone. Yeah, it'd yeah. be it'd be really hard to remake that and capture that same magic. It's this this insane. I, I don't know. I'm just babbling about it, but you just need to watch it and try and you you'll understand what I'm saying if you watch it. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will top you. Oh, for random. Okay. Um, and this is one that. 
I'm not entirely sure it wasn't just a TV movie originally. I had it on VHS, uh, but it's called Airborne. Mm-hmm. It came out in the 90s. Yeah. It's about a guy from California or a high school student from California who has to go stay with his family in Ohio uh-huh. um, for like a year. And just like the people at like his school don't accept him. They kind of pick mm-hmm. on him. He's got a cousin who's a nerd too or gets bullied. And he ends up bonding like through – he's – Really good at rollerblading, oh, nice. like super good at it. And they're all into hockey, uh, so he kind of wins them over with the street hockey game. One point shows up and mm-hmm. is awesome because he's so good at skating. And yeah. then it ends with this giant downhill uh, roller skating ra- race between these two teams. Cheesy, ridiculous, like sure. after school, and it is just like it is pure nostalgia for me. Yeah, when when COVID happened and we were stuck at home, you know, doing mm-hmm. work and that sort of thing, and I was home all day. I would throw that thing on to do work in the background all the oh, time because awesome. I didn't have to pay attention. And it just like, it just always gave me like warm feelings. Mm-hmm. His cousin is played by young Seth Green. Oh, nice. And it's fantastic. The uh, kind of main adversary for most of the movie uh, until they finally become friends uh-huh. at the end. His like right hand man is played by young Jack Black. Oh my god! Which is an amazing performance. Like yeah. you're kind of watching this like nothing movie and you're like, that's Jack Black. Jack and Black, he's yeah. being like, when you watch it, you go, yeah, that guy, you could tell that guy has something. He's yeah. going gonna, gonna to be something. That's always fun when you find someone yeah. in some nothing movie from a long time ago and then they right. came. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, it's. <laughs> so in the 80s and 90s, they made tons of movies like that. You know, yeah. like Gleaming the Cube. Yep. That's with Christian Slater. That's a yeah. skate. It's Where he's skateboarding and solving, solving crime. Solving crime at the same time. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, just terrible. But I tried to rewatch that like a year or two ago and I made it like 10 minutes in and I was like. I don't think I could do it. Dude, when I was younger, I thought that movie was a masterpiece, and Christian Slater was the coolest person in the world oh, in I'm that movie. You. I remember seeing it as a teenager. Oh, my gosh. Like, this movie's, it's got everything I want. It's got crime. It's got skateboarding. It's Literally, got Christian Slater. He is salt. Yeah. At one point, he like he's chasing the bad guy, and he is on his skateboard, and he grabs onto like a Ferrari. And this guy is going 90 miles an hour, and Christian Slater is holding on to the car on a skateboard. It's unbelievable. There's um, there's so many fun things about that. But, you know, there was a lot of mo- – like, I remember watching a movie when I was growing up called Rad. It was like a bic- – that movie, but just with bicycles. Right. It was like BMX bandits and all this stuff like yeah. that. I think uh, – well, I'm, I'm not meaning to skip your turn, but just talking no, about, like, okay. 80s movies that are fun and uh, Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, is one that goes oh, yeah. that like kind of nostalgic '80s yeah, fun for sure. uh, that I had didn't have on my list, but just whatever we were talking about just brought that up oh, to yeah. me. That was always uh, on when I was growing yeah. up. Yeah, and like I, that was another one where I'd stop on it when flipping channels mm-hmm. to just watch like, oh, this is that scene. I'll finish that scene, and before I know it, I just watched the yeah. whole thing. That's a fun movie because they're basically just like, all right, Eddie Murphy, just go be Eddie Murphy, yeah. and then he does, and that was a hugely successful successful movie yeah, too he is one of the very few people that i could think of that could pull off um being hilarious and like a goofy hilarious like doing weird impressions yeah. and stuff but also like you believe that he was tough and he yeah. could like win the shootouts and the fights he you was such a big those. star after that movie yeah and, you know going back into the 80s yeah yeah yeah, so a lot of mine, I mean, I could just rattle off movie after movie, but I think the, the comfort movie and the nostalgia thing really are linked together. Because I, I would pick something like Commando, mm-hmm. with, which I think I've talked about on here before with Schwarzenegger, which is, to say the least, ridiculous. But it's just so fun, and I just grew up watching it. It's, again... It's- the most one-liner movie oh my gosh. of all time. Like, every guy he kills, he drops a one-liner He for does. It. Every single guy. It is ridiculous. It is awful. It is. It makes no sense at all. You know, it's one of those, like, there's 45 bad guys shooting at Arnold with machine guns, and he's, like, in a wide open space. Of course, they don't hit him. It's all. It's got all that stuff. But just those, That that's my comfort zone, really, are those lower quality movies but just to have that quality to them where they're just so fun mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter if they're good or not right. you know what I mean like nobody was going to command you, you watch Commando Cobra's another one with Stallone you're getting exactly what you're promised you know action explosions one liners 
And I, I do kind of miss that era where you could make... I don't, I don't want to say they were intentionally bad movies, and especially I think at the time. They were taking those movies yeah. seriously, but now you look at them and they're just bad. Right. But it doesn't matter because they were fun. Yeah, it, you know, we constantly kind of reference things we could deep dive further into. Maybe one day we'll have to deep dive, deep dive into what makes the Commandos and Cobras bad but f- great fun. Yeah. And some of the, like, straight-to-DVD... Like, because I feel like the closest movies to that are some of these straight-to-DVD action movies that, like, Gerard Butler yeah. or somebody's in. And to me, those good, are just bad. And they're not... Yeah. They're not fun. So what's... Yeah. What's what, the difference? What's the charming bit of DNA in those I other ones that... that I would love work. to do that someday because we'll it is fascinating. We'll have to analyze that for sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to give one last one. This one is probably the epitome of a comfort movie to me and it, it combines uh, a couple of my, my categories. Uh, Sorkin, mm-hmm. sports, smartest guy in the room, Moneyball, Moneyball, yeah. and my favorite actor, Brad Pitt. Yeah, um, such a good movie. It, it to me, like, I, I don't even like baseball. Yeah. I find baseball boring. I can throw on that movie, and if you just think of like, okay, well, what really happens to that movie? It's a lot of, like, talking. It's a lot of... So talking about numbers. Numbers. It's... It should Statistics. be boring as crap. Yeah. And it is just, to me, endlessly watchable. I throw it on. It's One thing that's great about it is it's, it's low stakes when you think about it. Like, yeah. you know, Brad Pitt's character even says at one point, he goes, these are, like, uptown problems. I don't mm-hmm. have, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't have real problems. Yeah. Nobody's got, life is on the right. line. Uh, but it also is, like, it's his career. It's his sort of, like, defining achievement if he can pull this off. And mm-hmm. so there's stakes, but... You just get to root for the guy, not stress too much, yeah. enjoy the successes, and then the dialogue is just so good, the acting is so good. It's just, it's a fun hang with these guys trying to build this baseball team. It's unbelievable. There's that scene where Pitt is, I, and I may not get this exactly right, but he's with a like a manager of the team. They're just, mm-hmm. It's just those two guys in the room, and it's like, okay, call such and such, tell him he's going to be traded. And it's just this back and forth of like, guys on the phone, nope, I don't accept that, do this. And mm-hmm. it's an unbelievable scene, and it's just Pitt and somebody else just, is it maybe Philip Seymour Hoffman, maybe? Uh, it's do you know what I'm talking about? Jonah, Jonah Hill. Is it him and Jonah, Jonah Hill? Hill's character. Okay. Yeah. And they're yeah. just doing like these over-the-phone negotiations. I think sometimes you don't even hear what the person on the other end of the phone is saying, yeah. but it's so entertaining. Yeah, it is. Um, Philip C. Hoffman, Hoffman is in the movie. He plays yeah. the, the actual the manager, athletics, which is like the coach, yeah, the, the yeah, coach yeah. type manager, there you not go. the like general manager, yeah, yeah, season, yeah. but uh, which is one of those classic like Philip C. Hoffman's probably in like a collective five to ten minutes of the movie, yeah. but just so you feel his presence every moment he's in there. Oh you're my like gosh. so overqualified for the part. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You're playing this like really quiet guy who doesn't yeah. really do a whole lot. Let's get one of the greatest actors in the world. Yeah, someone who's incapable it. of giving a bad right. performance. Or there's like that part where Pitt, he's like, when I point at you, I want you to talk. And it's <laughs> yeah. Jonah Hill. And it's right. such a good movie. It is. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to give one to wrap up on? Sure. Jeez, uh, let me think. Because I, I got so many. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. That's, a, that's one for me. Just, it's on Disney+. Plus. I have found myself over the last couple of years throwing that on so often. Just if I'm folding laundry or something like that, just to have on. Yeah, that probably should be a uh, you know category. Just the adventure movie. The adventure movie. Because it's yeah. kind of it's kind of combines like uh, low stakes action in that like you know the hero's not going to die. Right. Uh, it's almost road trippy. Like you're going on oh, some yeah. like yeah. adventure. You usually got kind of a crew. Like yeah. it, it combines a lot of these elements. It combines them and all. It's, and it's just done at the it's, you know, it's a Spielberg yeah. movie. Just done at the highest, highest possible level. So yeah. I love to have that movie on. Yeah, it's it's one of those. Yeah, you you want to spend time in that environment yeah. because yeah. they just make it look like even the action scenes where he's in peril. They make it look fun. fun. Yeah, I know. Like, it's, like, oh, it's, it's fun to fight it, on top of this like tank or something. Yeah. You know, it'd be so fun to be Indiana Jones, and then the whole movie he's almost dying constantly. <laughs> but just. And again, I think that's the kind of movie it doesn't feel to me like they just make anymore. Just a fun, 
around the world adventure like it feels like the few times they've tried they've really felt like the uncharted movie uncharted. that came out like that was, felt like it was trying to be which almost goes back to like your your point of like commando and cobra like why are those fun yeah. even though they are ridiculous but and same thing like indiana jones is so fun and so rewatchable and you watch uncharted i never need to see that movie again for the rest of my life and i like tom holland and mark Wahlberg. yeah but, you know, I just watch it and I go, that wasn't bad, but will I ever watch that again for as long as I live? No. You know, and I've probably seen Raiders of the Lost Ark 75 times. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get into those we'll, things in the future. We'll get to the bottom of this one of these days. Yeah. Well, when we decide to get super nerdy and get real analytical, right now we're, we're staying pretty broad. We're kind of trying like, to stay broad. Here's what's, what movies we like and why we like yeah. them, but... We'll get into into some more of that. Yeah. So. This was an amazing discussion. It's yeah. fun to pick your brain and kind of think about movies that you just like to have on. Yeah. yeah. And haven't done this very much, but I just want to encourage any listeners, watchers of this episode mm-hmm. to share with us what your comfort movies are. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to hear it since you got to hear us talk about ours. Uh, I, I'd be fascinated to see just what types of movies. There's, I know I have friends who... When they want comfort, they've got to go comedy. They just need mm-hmm. that sort of lighthearted... They Step need that by themselves. Yes. Anchorman, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, of course, anybody who watches The Office over and over again. I actually had someone ask me this morning, because I told them what we were going to be talking about. And they were like, can you do TV shows? Because for me, it's The Office. I mean, right. that was just an immediate answer. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let us know, listeners, watchers, Absolutely. What, what you guys I love to engage with people in movie conversations. And I'm to the point... I don't, I don't look down or, or I, you know, you, someone tells me what their favorite movie is. And they'll go, you're probably going to laugh at me. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I love just, what you, you I know, that's the right thing I, about movies. You I can, said I love the movie Airborne, which is an objectionably <laughs> low quality yeah, movie. I mean, we definitely talked about Gleaming the Cube today. <laughs> so, obviously our bar is low. You know, we're not um, so sophisticated that we can't talk about Rocky 3 and 4 and Gleaming the Cube and... Cobra and Commando and Clue. Halloween 4 and 5. Oh. You know. What good acting. <laughs> Let's just talk about that some more. I'm so glad. It makes me so happy that we, could talk, we got to talk about Clue. Yes. I love, to, I love to try and introduce people to movies that maybe they haven't heard of. I definitely made my kids watch Absolutely. Clue. And I, I can't believe, I, before we go, I have to just mention this. One more comfort movie I can't believe I didn't mention. But it's been a while since I watched it. One Fine Day with George Clooney <laughs> and Michelle Pfeiffer. You just it's, want to keep the street going, don't I, you? I do. But it is actually like, that's what it is. It's a comfort movie. It's a, yeah. it's a here's some people with problems in lives and they're going to meet and through intertwining things throughout yeah. the day, they're going to kind of fall in love and it's just a feel good movie. Again, a movie, it feels to me like they don't make much anymore or they just kind of go straight to Netflix. Yeah. You know, back in my day, there was every, at least every month, there was some kind of you know, romantic comedy coming out. And they were kind of a big deal, and it doesn't feel like they they make those near as much. Yeah. Maybe everyone's right. Maybe the MCU did ruin movies. We'll have to talk about that sometime. We will. All right. Well, that'll this do was it fun. for today. Yeah. Yep. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week. I hope so.